So that's what we're going to talk about is uh, is actually how we are able to create a hundred innovations over ten years and generate a you know a hundred million jobs. Um, I, I'm not too keen on uh, call it uh, cradle to cradle, blue economy, sharing economy, whatever it is. Um, my logic is we have to do much better than we're doing now. Uh, by our latest count, we had a congress uh, on our activities uh, six weeks ago in Madrid, and we have generated three million jobs. So three million jobs, that's not bad, but we're far away from our 100 million target. What is very important is that we look at a new philosophy for innovation and for business. Innovation for me is not innovation technology. Innovation means innovation in business models. We have to compete in a different way. And to me, the first principle is that whatever we do, we have to have multiple benefits. It's not possible to do one thing for one person only or for one business only. So the core business core competence uh, logic to me is over. Second, we have to use what we have. And I must say that so many things that are in the circular economy should never have gotten the circular economy in the first place. Uh, if you use what you have, there are a lot of things that are there that you don't have. And that have been shipped around the world in a way that um, is questionable in order to get us to sustainability and competitiveness long term. Our innovation philosophy is we cascade everything nutrients, energy, and matter. We cluster businesses. We respond to basic needs. But very important, we always look at how to cut CapEx and OPEX. If you're not able to cut dramatically capital expenditures, and if you're not able to reduce operational expenditures, but operational expenditures are lower because you have more cash flow, because you have multiple cash flows. Our growth strategy, which uh, I presented last week to four members of the European Commission uh, to a group of uh, ministers from the European Union is based on a reindustrialization strategy. We're going to get industry going again, not by cutting costs, not by supply chain management, not by outsourcing, but by linking in agriculture and the primary sector back to industry. And that is a very fresh approach because it allows us to do what is in the second to last line, we grow through the multiplier effect. The amazing thing is that economists have been looking at the microeconomic impact of competitiveness by cutting costs. But they've forgotten that if you want to grow the economy, you need a multiplier effect. And the multiplier effect kicks in when you have more money circulating in the lower in, in, in the local economy, more money in the local economy, and when the circulation of uh, the local money is combined with more industrial activity. I have a great team all around the world. We have 900 people, 3,000 scientists and 900 people in implementation. And we're not about deciding what's good or bad. We're focusing that everything can be done much better. But we are very stressed by some of the traditional ecological views like the planting of the tree. I have planted trees, and I hope many of you have planted trees as well. But in order to get a result from the planting of the tree, you need a generation. Within a generation, you don't see any impact. And we don't have a generation anymore. Particularly if your kids are hungry, then you have the right to be impatient. So everything I do, I try to reflect also what I do with my family. And here you see my children. I have, I have five children. And you see that two of my kids are mushroom farmers. The youngest one, Philippe Emmanuel, is two and a half years in that picture. And his sister, Cheeto, who was then 25, uh, teaches him how to farm mushrooms. Now, farming mushrooms is pretty easy. You take a wild mushroom, put a piece in a wet newspaper, keep it for two weeks, and then you can inoculate it into a um, substrate from coffee waste or uh, straw or uh, grass clippings. Now, if you have a young boy of two and a half, three years old who knows how to provide his own food through mushrooms grown on agricultural waste that is all around him, try to convince him you need GMO products in order to be competitive. You don't. He doesn't understand GMO. He doesn't understand what we're talking about. He knows that this works, and he knows that it's a much healthier food. So the, the capacity of bringing mushroom farming to a different level uh, is one of the strategies that we've pursued. 
So we differentiate ourselves from the green economy where everything that is good for you is expensive, which is a strange economy, because everything that's cheap on the market is bad for you and for the environment. So my blue economy focuses on innovations in business models where you generate jobs and are competitive because you generate more value. And that's the whole approach. But for that, you need a vision, not a prescribed idea, not a menu to follow. You need a vision and you navigate between fantasy and reality. And science is the driving force and you have to be able and capable of taking risks. You know, one of the biggest problems in Europe is people not prepared to take risks anymore. Everything is so fundamentally risk averse that therefore we need to change our culture of how we get people to take the action. From here on, I'm only going to give you cases. I'm going to describe you five cases of projects that evolved from a $5,000 per initiative to a 500 million euro initiative. And I'll show you how we are refusing to debate and obsessed with implementation. Here you see a project in Chipinga in Zimbabwe. And when you go to women, and women know that they can get food in two, three weeks time by farming mushrooms on their agricultural waste, then they get up and they dance. What do we do in Europe? When we get a great idea in Europe, we want a feasibility study. We want a technology audit. We want a pilot study. We want a certification of the results. I mean, that's the reason why we just never are able to move fast. But on the other hand, here you see a picture of how we started in Paris, downtown Paris, farming mushrooms from the Café de, de la Paix, Café Les Deux Magots, and we're farming in the center of Paris. One of these containers takes four parking spaces, and the, the, the mayor of Paris has given us the permission to do it. But if you look at the picture in the center, I just wonder if you have any idea how much money this is worth over a year's basis. This is worth $480,000 of a production facility that takes the space of four parking spots in the center of Paris. And we're able to provide mushrooms fresh in the center of Paris at half of the cost of the present system. We're able to pay people 16 euros per hour, and we're head on competing. Using what? A waste material for which the cafes have to pay money to have it picked up at six in the morning. The same concept is developed in different market systems. But the key is that we forget that when you drink a cup of coffee, you only consume 0.2%. That means 99.8% is wasted. Now, if we take that and take it into the mushroom farming as a first step, we're improving factor 500. But we go beyond it. We go beyond the better food and the more food. Today, we have more than 300 companies established. But today, we are entering the whole market of what is called the biochemistry of coffee. 20 cups of coffee is equal to one meter of fabric. One meter of fabric. On top of that, this is a fabric that controls odor. And if you have odor control, then you go out jogging, you come back in your Nike suits, and you don't smell. It's a very you can smell. Yes? Yeah. <clears throat> Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, we can still hear you, Vincent. Good. Sorry for the interruption. Um, so the logic is that first you drink it, the cup of coffee, then you eat it, eat the mushrooms, and then you wear it in your clothing. Now that is generating a multiple revenue from the grain of coffee. Timberland has now launched a campaign in the United States which says drink it, wear it. There is 10% of coffee in the inside of the shoe. Now, the first factory was established last year. We're building three new factories this year. We can't keep up with demand. Functional textiles at a lower cost. That's what we're offering. Here you see a solar panel. May I ask you the question if someone is not on mute? Do solar panels work at night? Intuitively, we say no. But the reality is that black radiates at night and you generate free cooling. The result is that we have these uh, solar systems with a small pipe on the inside, and that little pipe has water. At night, the water gets cold, four, five, six degrees. 
Then we create a small space underneath a home in Africa, and now we have cooling without a refrigerator, without a compressor, without the need for electricity. And now we can let the sun shine on both sides of the solar panel, because traditionally the solar panels only use the top, never the bottom. Because if we're using the bottom, the technology guys are saying that the panel gets too hot and therefore efficiency drops. Except when you cool it, just like you cool a car. One third of the material gives us five times the energy. Now the result is that by using this type of panel, the combination of power, heat and chill gives you 825 kilowatt hours per square meter, which makes a laughing stock of the present solar panels that are the standard of the market and which you've seen everywhere. Now where is the research and development going for all the major corporations in the world? Only on getting more electricity out of it. There are only four companies in the world, and they're all small, producing the combination of heat, power, and chill. Now let me, if you see this picture, please realize that this works in Sweden. If it works in Sweden, I submit to you, it works everywhere. I don't need a technology audit. Work better even, it's made with recycled plastics. The whole base is made with recycled plastics. And that means that since we're using recycled plastics, we're generating a new market for these recycled plastics because this is competing with aluminum. Now, thanks to the heat-resistant recycled plastics, we can make this into a roof material. Now, it is a roof. So we have a heat effect, chill, power, it's a roof. Since we have 22 centimeters of air, it's an insulation. And since we keep the water at uh, more than 60 degrees for more than three hours, we're sanitize it without any membranes and without any chemicals. Next case, mining. Big problem with mines is water. In Latin America, the high altitudes, same with Africa and Asia in high altitudes, we are removing the non-native species. We plant bamboo species, which is native, and the, the bamboo drops the surface temperature by 10 degrees. Or if you drop the surface by 10 degrees in temperature, then you have more rain. Now we have rain, which meets the demand of the community and the mine to have more water. But then we have bamboo, and the bamboo is used for housing. Here you see a $950 home in Guayaquil, Ecuador. But the beauty of it is it's so cheap because no one has to pay for the land. No one has to pay for the land planting. The only thing you do is harvest and make a home out of it. I have quite a bit of experience with bamboo buildings, as you see on this structure that uh, I even got approved according to the German building codes. And here you see a picture of Vitra Design in Weil am Rhein in Germany who produced a book on it. Now I have water and I have housing, but there's still 16 meters left over. And with that, we make paper. Yesterday you want recycled paper. Today you want uh, sustainable forestry certified paper. Paper. Tomorrow you need bamboo paper. Water, paper, housing, and by the way, we're generating topsoil and we fix CO2, all thanks to mining. Now, today, if you look at gold mines with a world market price for a trans of, of uh, uh, a troy ounce of uh, gold to dropping below $1,300, most of them would have to close their operations because their cost is $1,100. What we are offering to the mining companies is cut costs and generate more revenue. And that is the secret of the success of uh, how we look at competitiveness. And it only has just begun because the biggest waste of the mine is not water. The biggest waste is stones. Here you see a picture of one of the mines in, in South Africa with a couple, with uh, actually 800 million tons of uh, ground up stones. It just leaves there, it exposed to the air, it generates dust, but it's a great for paper. We designed already 18 years ago stone paper where we use crushed stones and blend it with uh, polyethylene uh, bottles, the PET bottles. And that allows us to have a paper that is extremely competitive. It is tree-free paper, water-free paper, 100% recyclable, and 100 million hectares of land that today is locking up land to create forests can be freed up again for farming. We use no water, no trees, 100% recyclable. Here you see some playing cards 
a magazine made from stone paper in China, some notebooks, and it is only starting because here you see a shoe that is 60% made from stone. The beauty of it is stone, together with uh, polyethylene, allows, you, allows no water in, but allows the shoe to breathe. And of course, if you can see that sole is pretty dark because we mix it with coffee. You know, like this, we start clustering those industries, which get us to a complete different look at how we design business. Now here, we take on a very different uh, perspective, and that is fishing. The uh, European Union is a disaster. We are, as Europeans, we have overfished, well, together with our Japanese friends, uh, we have overfished 85% of the world's stocks. Now tell me how to do a circular economy for overfishing. <laughs> no, you gotta change the model completely. You can't keep fish into the type of cycles that we're doing today. The worst is that 70% of what we catch, we never eat. That's pretty dumb. And therefore, we have an issue of killing off the fish stocks. And the 70% we don't eat, well, we need supply uh, to be taken up. And therefore, we're massively investing in salmon farms because the salmons are about the only ones that can eat that mix of leftovers. Salmon is not a solution for fish protein. It is a solution for the massive overfishing that we've done. And we've just put it out of context and put it in a different logic spin. But let me give you a, a very fundamental question. What would you consider a farmer who wants to kill a goat or a cow that is expecting a baby? We would consider them brutal, inhuman, unacceptable. The problem is, though, that one third of all the female fishes we fish have eggs and we kill them. I mean, I don't get it. This is one of the most stupid attitudes of the human being, and it's never been questioned. It's not a question of a circular economy or a cradle to cradle or any of that. So we felt that here is a need for a completely different business model driven by the ethics that if we want to restore fish stock, we can't keep on killing females with eggs. So we ran a test in El Liero in Spain, where in two years' time, none of the females were harvested. The fishing in the nets was done very carefully. All the females were checked when there was a female with eggs back into the sea. And we did it for two years. Can you imagine that in two years, the fish stocks went back to the level of 1950? In two years. And it's obvious, because when you have a female fish of half a kilo, you got 500 eggs. If you have a female fish of, of one kilo, you have 3,000 eggs. And this is the challenge that we are facing. We are facing a challenge that we are blind to how to really create a sustainable environment with thriving fish stocks. And that is not about killing the fish better with better nets. It's about not using nets in the first place and knowing how to detect the pre pregnancy. We have designed now a new fishing technique where we use air bubbles exactly the same way as whales do and dolphins do. And this led to the design of a complete new fishing vessel. It's a catamaran. It's not anymore the typical vessel you've seen. And thanks to Oracle and BMW, we have access to the sailing techniques that they have used to win the America's Cup. Four fixed sails on the catamaran, and each of the sails is equipped with solar panels. Now, these are the the latest sails that pull the boat forward instead of pushing the boat forward. The panels are used when there is no wind. And as such, we have 100% eliminated all fuel on the boat. This is possible because we don't drag nets anymore. If you have to drag a two kilometer net, you better have a good torque engine. But on top of that, we don't throw the fish anymore on, on the ice because the fish that is caught is put into the sides of the catamaran and the fish is put onto two to six degrees Celsius. And then we have an infrared and echographic control system that identifies every single fish with eggs. And that one is thrown back into the sea. Now, this is, this is innovation. We process the fish on the boat. We reach break even in 18 months. It's only renewable energy. And since we process the fish on the boat, we have more revenues and we double the number of jobs. Now, now that is sustainability. That is blue economy. This is going beyond the logic that we know today. 
Now I challenge you to know which is the country that leads this. The country that leads this. Uh, the country that leads this is Morocco. Morocco in 2014 will have the first fleet of these ships based in Agadir. It's an amazing thing. The European Union, I presented it to them and they said, no, 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 we have to work with quota. We first deal with the quota, then we'll get to new technologies. In the meantime, we'll continue overfishing. This is unethical. And even when you have certified fishing or fish stocks from non-depleted sources like Unilever One, it's not good enough. We cannot just certify that we're not depleting. We have to certify that we are restoring the fish stocks around the world. Increase also the protein and increase the income. I'm giving your last case and then we can go into some discussions. I mean, what do you think you can do with a weed like a thistle? Well, at first sight, thistles are a problem. Actually, it is the subject of one of the most aggressive destructions uh, by chemicals uh, in the whole world. We just don't like thistles. But when the European Union decide to take 70,000 hectares of land out of production in Sardinia, basically Sardinia got infested with thistles. The thistles, as we know from the company Nova Mont, which is based in Novara in Italy, of which I'm the chairman, we know that we can derive a whole range of products out of thistles. We can make plastics, lubricants, herbicides, elastomers. We can generate uh, protein and animal feed. We can give the farmers the job to clear those fields. But the most important is we can use the infrastructure of a petrochemical plant. Here you see the picture of Porto Torres. Porto Torres is a 1,500 hectare facility of any, sometimes known as Agit in some countries. ENI is the eighth largest petrochemical group. They have a, a, a chemical company called Versalis, but they were relying on cheap NAFTA, like the rest of Europe was. Now, NAFTA has increased in price. Europe cannot compete against the Middle East. So Europe will be closing about 25 petrochemical plants in the next uh, two or three years. Here you see a plant that was mothballed, decided to be closed last year. And our team from Novamont studied the facility and realized that 80% of the infrastructure could immediately be reused in order to produce bioplastics. We created there the first biorefinery in the world with weed as a feedstock. We need to work with weeds because there are no farmers anymore. I mean, people in Sardinia thought, and like in many other places in the world, people thought that um, tourism was the future. I mean, we have this very strange logic that we evolve from agriculture to industry to services. I'm sorry to say in a very blunt way, this is bullshit. This is one of the reasons why we're not capable of generating value added at a massive scale anymore. So we are demonstrating with a 550 million euro investment, converting this facility into the first uh, large scale biorefinery in the world, that we're able to generate a much better cash flow, a much better return on, on investment, but that we also change the balance sheet for ENI. But in terms of what is interest of you in, in circular economy and, and all the comparable concepts, is that originally, this facility was processing 2.5 million tons of petroleum into 700,000 tons of chemicals. We will be processing 360,000 tons of thistles, weed, into 350,000 tons of a portfolio of six products that generate six cash flows. Very different approach. Now, instead of having hundreds of millions of euros flowing into the pockets of uh, Libya, we now have 180 million euros flowing into the pockets of the local farmers. And that is exactly the kind of catalytic effect, multiplier effect, that we need to put in place in order to succeed with that reindustrialization of the European economy. It's not difficult to do it, but the main, steps, the main challenge we have is that we're stuck with the core business model that was designed by the MBAs of Harvard, that was a great uh, thought process after the Second World War, but it is not getting us into the next phase of society.